Hey guys, look. <laughs> and the name of the character is. So I'm here in uh, Le Brassus with uh, François Henri Benamias uh, at the headquarters of Honor Pillet. And uh, we're here today to discuss the uh, present of Honor Pillet with the uh, Spider Man, the past and the future, what it's going to look like, your future. So you're wearing the Honor Pillet Spider Man watch that just released? Yeah, it's released. Uh, but not delivered yet. We are, deliver we are starting the deliveries in July. So that's the only one you're going to see right now. Currently available. It's not, it's not available. It's on my wrist. Do you understand? <laughs> so it's not available. It's on my wrist. 15 years ago, you had an idea. You wanted to collaborate with Marvel, but they didn't want to do it. So what changed and how did you make your vision into reality? First of all, I don't think that 15 years ago, the brand was what we are today. We've also improved a lot about the awareness and everything we've done in the story of culture makes us even better now compared to what we were then. The second thing is when we, we finally partnered with them, it was about the comic books. Because the comic books has a much longer history, obviously, than the movies. I mean, the Marvel venture started in the 1930s, I think, 1939. And by partnering with the comic book side of it, it allowed us a lot more possibilities and we didn't have to think about having the watches worn in movies. You had a friendship with Don Cheadle that allowed the, the beginning of this partnership with uh, Marvel. So could you talk me through a bit how that happened, how that conversation arose? Sure. So I met Don for the first time in 2010 on the red carpet of the Tony Awards. And he was wearing that night a watch company which was not Audemars Piguet. So I didn't know him. But I saw the watch he was wearing and I said, why don't you wear AP? He said, why should I wear AP? And that's how we started to connect. And we became friends. And eventually, he started to wear AP in some of his TV shows. Fast forward, uh, we are maybe talking to each other three, four times a year. And then we lost track of each other for maybe two or three years. And I'm on holidays in Spain with my wife. And then the phone rings and it's done. He said, where are you in the world? So I'm in Spain, I'm heading to Paris. And he said, I'm going to be in Paris as well. Where do you stay in Paris? La Reserve. I said, La Reserve. Drinks with the wife, drinks with the wife. And after 15 minutes of sharing the drinks, I, share, I, I told him the story about how sad I was that basically we couldn't do anything with Marvel. He said, I could fix that for you. And he called Kevin Feige, the CEO of Marvel, in two seconds. Wow. He said, oh, I'm here with my friend Francois. He wants to do something with Marvel. I say, sure, let's meet in Los Angeles. Three weeks later, Don and I walked into a room full of people from Marvel and the lawyer in charge of all the deals at Marvel, French lawyer. So everything was constantly. I love when you speak German. <laughs> yeah. And so the first watch that uh, you guys released was the Audemars Piguet Black Panther. I mean, the Black Panther was hugely successful in the black community, specifically in America, with LeBron James, Kevin Hart, you had Serena Williams. So who is the target audience for the uh, Audemars Piguet uh, Spider-Man model? Is it young guys like me or Miles Morales or uh, Tom Holland? Who, who is the target audience? First of all, let me go back on Black Panther for a second, because yes, obviously, it goes to a field where you would see a lot of African-American enjoying the watch. but. It was a limited edition of 250 watches. We sold only 50 watches in the US. Okay? So we sold 200 watches outside from China to Japan to Singapore to Thailand. So, I mean, these characters appeal to a worldwide crowd. It goes beyond colors, everything. It doesn't matter at all. But when you ask the question about who would be the targeted client, we don't target our clients. Funny enough, we don't do this ever. Because who am I to say that whether it's Black Panther or Spider-Man would be or should be worn by a maximum of 28 years old, especially if he lives in the UK? No. If you enjoy Marvel and enjoy Audemars Piguet for what we stand for and what we're about, then anybody's welcome. Women are buying and both Black Panther and women are buying uh, Spider-Man as well. So it's never about putting people in boxes, which I'm completely against, it's much more, you love, come. There's been also a lot of, you know, it's Audemars Piguet, there's always controversy. Um, Why? Why do you say that? Well, Audemars Piguet is a unique brand. They, they... Why controversy? 
Because they push the barriers of creativity. And that's why how you create controversy? It is. By doing these? I think, I think that leads to sometimes controversy. I mean, you had obviously the uh, Roy Loke and you have all these models that people don't necessarily agree with. I mean, a lot of people are saying that the uh, Spider-Man model is for too young people, like kids even, they're saying. Why are they saying that? I want what do you think about that? the addresses of these people <laughs> right now. I want to know where they live. We got to pay a little visit. We'll go together. Sure, but <laughs> no, because you, you're too tall. They're going to see you coming from a mile away. So there was a, um, another question I wanted to ask that I forgot to ask about the uh, Spider-Man that, that you're wearing. Are there any anecdotes about, you know, how, how it was made, about how it was designed, about, you know, little secrets that the uh, average person wouldn't know about that you'd like to Absolutely share? Absolutely not. <laughs> No secret spider webs somewhere, Easter eggs. No, no, there was something. Let me, uh, there was something. We had the idea that at some point we would put the, the spider web on the glass, but it would be invisible. And to see it, you would have to actually blow air on, on, on the glass, and then the, sp the spider web would appear. But then we thought about it, and it was not just even a, a nice. That. <laughs> Which is so a full of people. Spit on the thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah not really cool. So I say, it was a, no, but the, the vibe was cool. When we thought about the execution, you have with your friends say, hey guys, look. <laughs> it's, like, it's like a dusty watch, right? It's yeah, like you're like, sort of, you're uh, yeah. dust so we watch. stopped that. That's an anecdote. I heard that there will not be a, a person, a uh, character, yeah. not be a figure on the next no, no. watch. It's inspired by a character, obviously, but you won't see a character on the watch. But I saw the prototype like a week ago. It's unbelievable. Wow. Really. So you guys can judge what you think it is. You have to wait until 2025. <laughs> the 150 years. Yes. And the name of the character is... <laughs> wait. No, I forgot. <laughs> Not Iron Man. Because no. of the uh, Iron Man race. Exactly. And so speaking of this watch and speaking of um, spoilers, uh, I brought you a little gift. I don't know if the camera can see it. Um, and I know you can't talk about... Look yet. I know you can't talk about the next releases. Uh, but I just wanted to show you a couple of things and see how much you smile. Okay. I don't have a little meter to see. So look, no, I'm going to wait. Think about something serious. Oh. It. Last reaction there. <laughs> Anything else? You see, you, you, I thought this would work better. To I was me. a poker player. Did you really want me to? It's so easy for me. <laughs> you were a poker player in the past. You're obviously a golfer in the past. You have the competitive spirit. That's something that you have. That's something that you've brought to the company, and that's something that lives in the company and business. How would you say that this? you know, com com competitiveness coming from golf, coming from poker playing, has translated into the watch world, into what, you're do what you do. I was a competitor, I think, since as far as I can remember, very young, very, very young. I don't know where it comes from, but I was a competitor. I always hated to lose. And I always made a point of, uh, if you challenge me on something and you tell me that something is impossible or I won't be able to do a certain thing, I will make you and I will prove you wrong on purpose. That's the way I've been built. Now, when you apply this to the business, there is a big difference. In business, there is never a finish line. When you think about it. Someone told me recently, which I love as, a, as, a, as an idea, I say, a business, it's a mountain without a summit. You keep climbing, keep climbing yeah. it never stops. There is never a finish line in business. Mm. So you can compete. But no matter how hard you compete, it keeps going. There's always someone to compete against as well. You can't. We can't and sometimes really you're gonna lose a little bit. You're gonna go back up. It's but it, it never ends. That's the beauty of it. So it's not only about competition at, at that point. It's building, building a, a perceived value and making sure that Audemars Piguet is perceived now much better than when it was maybe ten years ago, twenty years ago, thirty years ago. And that people that will take over will keep working on the path 
to make that watch company the absolute exception. When you were golfing, you never made it to number one. You never made it to number one in France. Is that the reason why? Is it because there was a visible summit and that's why you had your block? Completely. If I know there is a finish line, I'm not as good at all because I put myself under so much pressure that it doesn't work because it basically doesn't allow you for mistakes. So if you know going to something that you're going to make mistakes and still going to be okay, then let's go. Let's play. That's a huge difference. Huge. The good news for me, I just found that out a month ago about myself. I finally found why I was bad in golf and good in business because of that finish line. You were talking about the finish line. At the end of 2023, you will be sadly leaving Audemars Piguet after nearly 30 years at the brand and more than 10 years uh, as, the, as the CEO. Do you think Audemars Piguet is going to change after you leave? We're not going to see huge changes because we have not made huge changes for the last five years. We made huge changes uh, when I took over in 2012. And then since 2019, pretty much, we are now building on everything we, we put together and it's successful. So when the new person comes, uh, she will bring her own way of running a business. But I do believe that we gotta, we gotta, see, we gotta see things going uh, very smooth. Audemars Piguet is always pushing the, the boundaries of creativity, obviously, and that's just expected at this point, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you've had the code, you've had the Royal Oak, you've had, I mean, all sorts of model. There's always been backlash. That's what I mean by controversies. When you are creative, when you create beautiful things, there will be people who disagree, obviously. Um, and so how do, you, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with those people? First of all, the second you work in the world of creations, whether it's in fashion, jewelry, name it, anything you want, even movies. I mean, name anything you want and you expose yourself to people, people will judge in a good way or in a bad way. And if you don't want to be judged, then stay home. Don't do anything. So basically by sitting at the table, you have to be willing to hear things that you might not like. And that's a part of any businesses today. It just, you have to look at it. Do we pay attention to it? No, not at all. That it doesn't matter. If we were starting to pay attention to all these comments everywhere, we, we would we'd never do anything. No. Audemars Piguet has been in business since 1875. Through the history of the brand, have we done everything always by the book? No. Have we, disturb, have we, have we, have we been disruptors of the market? Absolutely. If we would have had social media in 1972, when the Royal Oak got launched, we would have been crushed by everyone. 51 years later, that's a right oak, one of the most iconic watches ever. So we have to go with the flow. The thing that never lies, it's like a boxing fight. It's the last man standing. Meaning, in our, in our field, if the watches set out, the way I think they're gonna set out, it, it means that it was good or better than good. That's it. If the watch raised, the unique piece fa fetched 6.2 million Incredible. when we fetched 5.2 million with Black Panther two years ago, which is the absolute world record for any other Marpiguet watches ever, it means there is some seriousness there. That's what I want to think about. The guy that say, oh, it's only for kids who are eight years old, don't care. And for the, uh, the auction of the uh, Black Panther, I heard there was a bug that didn't allow the auction to go higher than it was expected to be. Who are you? How do you know that? <laughs> do we know this guy? Have we checked him out? Yeah. Seriously? <laughs> First of all, they come with three cameras. I've never seen this for an interview in my life. <laughs> He's like, the, are you Steven Spielberg's <laughs> grandson or something? Anyway. Um, yes, we had a bug. I mean, the auction could have gone a lot further. But this is a part of the sort of thing that happens sometimes. It stopped at 5.2 million. It's part of history now. Yeah. 50 hours is how long it takes to make the uh, Spider-Man on the watch, correct? Pretty much. So this watch, just like this uh, Spider-Man, just like 
uh, many elements of Audemars Piguet, such as the design of the uh, Royal Oak, are done consulting people outside of the brand. And they're always done, however, in Switzerland. So we talked uh, about this with Mark. Why do you feel responsibility for the artisans? If you talk about France as a country, for example, you got to hear what defines France. You got to hear uh, or represent France. Bread, cheese, wine, luxury, whatever. Switzerland, banks, chocolate, watches. Ski. Even though, huh? Ski, okay. But even though many countries are making watches, but Switzerland is the country for watches. So you need to protect this because if we don't do this correctly, 100 years from now, it could be completely gone. And that would be a real disaster. And it would be a disgrace because this is where it started and that should remain that way. So we need to protect all these suppliers, the people that are helping us putting all these watches together because for the course of the, of, of the years to come, we need to guarantee that they will still be alive. So if for just a chase of an additional margin, you start to go outside in other countries where you're going to gain maybe 20, 20 francs on something and you, don't, and you don't use the people here, they're gone. The second they're gone, the industry is gone. The second the industry is gone, watchmaking is pretty much gone, the way we look at it. So we need to protect this. One time that the uh, Swiss watch industry was in danger was during the famous quartz crisis. Mm -hmm. So during this time, Audemars Piguet did produce quartz models. However, you decide to stay in uh, the mechanical uh, field. And one of the things you did is you had pushed the uh, perpetual calendar, a watch that was worth over 15,000 francs at a time when Seiko, for example, was releasing very cheap watches. Why did you go against the flow rather than decide to follow the fad or you know, follow the, 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 the trend of the quartz? Or oh, because if Audemars Piguet in the 70s would have then changed completely the strategy and made only quartz watches, the company would be dead today, completely, completely dead. The DNA of AP is to make extremely complicated mechanisms, mechanical mechanisms, not quartz mechanisms. So the second you go away from your DNA, you sell your soul, you're dead. So they made the right decision to keep not only working on mechanical mechanisms, but also to launch new complications like the perpetual calendar wristwatch in, the, in 1978 and then the tourbillon in 1986, all those type of things. That's who we are. If we start also on top of this to follow the market, to follow trends, that's not AP anymore. You have to look at other watch companies for that. Uh, there's been the quartz crisis, there's been financial crises, there's been the COVID crisis. And one crisis that I believe that the watch industry might have to go through will be the metaverse or the, you know, however you want to call it. You look at this as a crisis? No, it's a disruption. It's a new player in town. This is not a crisis. Because if the metaverse comes, it means that, that the existing world crashes. There is nothing anymore. It's only metaverse now. That could be a crisis. That's not what's happening. But will people still wear watches if they're in their, in their digital world all the time? What's the, what's oh, the... I love your question. I love your question. <laughs> because basically the journalists five, six years ago were telling us the exact same thing. So guys, smartwatches are, are now taking a big place. The young generation will never wear watches again or they will wear smartwatches. So basically, on Piguet and the others, you're dead. You're going to die. Fast forward, we've never been stronger especially with the new generation that was supposed to be dead for the watchmaking industry. Dead. So it's not because you've got to add now an, a new player in town called Metaverse, then suddenly people will not enjoy craftsmanship, exclusivity, and everything that defines watchmaking. So you cannot categorize things that way. You could enjoy going to a McDonald's or Burger King and enjoy a very fancy meal Okay, made by a chef, which is very difficult to get access to even get a table. It's not one or the other, it's one and the other. Enjoy the metaverse and enjoy wearing your watches. Think about it that way. When we launched the watch with Jay, Jay-Z, 
in 2005, the world of hip hop was never attached, had never been attached to the world of luxury. We were in, in, in that spirit forward thinking on something which became huge. Mm. Metaverse, I do believe is here to not only to stay, but to develop and be even better and better and better. So people will embrace metaverse. Do we need to be the first to do it? No. But at some point, are we looking at everything in that field to eventually join or do something? Absolutely. That would be a challenge. Why a challenge? Well, how do you make something mechanical in the digital world? But what makes you think that we would have to make something digital to be exist as Audemars Piguet in the metaverse? Audemars Piguet could be com something completely different in the metaverse. Stop asking questions about this. Please. So to transition about what Audemars Piguet, how they define themselves, you talked about connected straps, straps that would track the pH and be able to tell whether Are someone... Are you a stalker? <laughs> no, seriously, he knows everything I've said. <laughs> okay. And be able to tell whether someone is going to have a heart attack a few days before or other functionalities that you could fit within the watch strap. You were adamant about not digitalizing the actual face of the watch, but the, you said you could do the watch strap. Are there plans for this in the future? Is it something you're still exploring? I have a dream. That one day, <laughs> we're going to be able to deliver smart bracelets, not, not watches, smart bracelets. Now, what these bracelets will be able to deliver or achieve in the next one, two, three, five, ten years, we don't know yet. But if you just to count your steps, irrelevant doesn't, mm. doesn't make any sense. If it has a real usage, which is extremely smart and as a size, which is small enough not to interfere with the aesthetic of the bracelet, which right now we are struggling with because it's too big. So no matter what we do, we cannot hide it the right way. So for me, it doesn't make any sense. We never actually agree to settle on beauty for convenience. Never. So it's a work in progress. We've been working on this for already five years. Now we'll, and we learn. And eventually, at some point, it will be small and smart enough to end up on the bracelet. And it's, it's not discussed very much in the watch world, the strap. I mean, it's something that I, I started getting into watch world when I was about 16 years old, four years ago. And one thing that I really cared about, surprisingly, is the strap. I could see a beautiful watch, but say, oh, the strap is ugly. I don't want that watch. I think that's something really that is something that you could focus on, right, as a brand is how to approach the straps differently. And that's something that you've done very well with the interchangeable straps, notably with uh, this watch, correct? Me. <laughs> yes. The last thing for me would be, you know, you have had countless people ask you, what's your next move? What's your next move? What's your next move? And you also say you don't know. Do you have an answer this time today to what you're going to do after Audemars Piguet? No. <laughs> no, I'm going to tell you three things, okay? Three hints. One, I'm not leaving Switzerland. Two, I will never be an employee ever again. Three, that's big. I'm going to stop working for six months to reboot the system, to be ready for the next venture. This I can say. And that's all you will get. Do you understand? <laughs> if I you understand. ask me the question one more time, I've got friends here. Good question. <laughs> And this you can keep, by the way. This is really? your, it's your present. Oh, thank you, you so can, much. You can wear this. Composer. Thank you. <laughs>